you come from London today then, I imagine? Well, yes, I live in Windsor. Ah, okay. So in Fort Collins. Reading, Cardiff. Yeah, not too bad then. Not too bad. All right, well, I'll kick us off, I think. Um, you know, it's about time, shall I? Um, good evening and welcome. I think it's about time that we kicked off. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the uh, Islam UK uh, uh, Public Lecture Series 2015. Um, I, it also gives me a tremendous pleasure to uh, 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 welcome Professor Humayun Ansari, um, who is Professor of the History of Islam and Culture in the Centre for Minority Studies and the Department of History at Royal Holloway, University of London. Um, Professor Ansari's publications and interests abroad, uh, spanning both history and the uh, social sciences. What runs through them uh, is a sense of the pressing or their pressing relevance to contemporary issues. His long and varied research record takes us from ethnic diversity and cross-cultural issues in contemporary Britain to Muslims in South Asia, from attitudes to jihad, martyrdom, and terrorism amongst British Muslims to the South African Jewish diaspora. Um, his primary focus is Islam and the experience of Muslims in Britain and other Western societies. His work, uh, with its dual focus on both history and contemporary societies, is thus inter and multidisciplinary and of interest not just to academics, but also government, policymakers, and anyone involved in community level activity. Professor Ansari's long and distinguished publication record includes an important monograph for Oxford University Press, The Emergence of Socialist Thought Amongst North Indian Muslims, 1917 to 1947. Um, he is currently preparing a scholarly edition of the minutes of the London Mosque Fund and the East London Mosque Trust. Uh, oh, sorry, it's been published. There we are. Um, it's, uh, he has prepared uh, uh, this work. Um, and thus, we have a significant new contribu contribution to the scholarly resources available um, for the development of what Professor Ansari calls a more textured understanding of the development and the place of Muslims within British society. Uh, and I think this is something which we can all agree is an urgent requirement at the present time. Um, his paper today is entitled Loyal Enemies or Critical Friends the challenges for British Muslims in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Now, the lecture will last for 40 to 45 minutes. Um, we will then have 15 to 20 minutes for questions and uh, discussion. If I could ask you to put your mobiles on silent, I would be, uh, uh, well, I'm going to ask you, please do it, in fact. Um, and uh, I would point out the location of fire exits uh, here and here. Um, finally, I would like to welcome our uh, remote uh, uh, guests or uh, listeners uh, who are uh, joining us digitally. Um, and uh, with that, um, I will pass you over to our guest speaker. Thank you, Professor Ansari. Well, thank, thank you very much indeed. Um, I suppose first of all, um, I would like to, uh, to thank uh, the, uh, uh, the center, the Muslim Center for, uh, for inviting me here. Um, I've been to Cardiff before, uh, in fact, a long, long time back when I was at the University of Exeter, we used to come here and play cricket. Um, and uh, that were our very fond memories of, of being to Cardiff um, from then. Um, delighted to be here, and uh, uh, I hope uh, you'll find uh, what I have to say uh, interesting. Charlie Hebdo and, uh, and, and the Jewish uh, supermarket murders uh, in Paris, and not to mention events uh, such as the, the killings in, in Denmark uh, last weekend, have yet again brought Muslims in, in Europe under the spotlight. Uh, last month, Eric Pickles, Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government, fired off a letter to uh, around uh, 1,000 Muslim faith leaders provoking the Muslim Council of Britain, uh, to quote their spokesman, to take issue with the implementation, uh, the implications really, that extremism takes place at mosques and that the Muslims have not done enough to challenge the terrorism that uh, took place in our name, and that Muslims and Islam are inherently apart from British society, that Muslims must go out of their way to prove their loyalty to their country of, uh, to this country of ours. And that's what, um, you know, uh, just to paraphrase, 
what uh, the Muslim Council of Britain folks uh, and persons were saying. The siren voices of uh, those referring to the existence of a fifth column within our country, for instance, Nigel Farage of UKIP, uh, were again ringing loudly. What I believe uh, uh, that we are witnessing here is uh, the latest bout of popular and, uh, and uh, official political discourse on the questions of, of loyalties, uh, which has emerged over the last uh, two decades, particularly in relation to Muslims. And this has happened in the, in the context of wars in Bosnia, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Libya, Somalia, the Yemen, Syria, and most recently, uh, uh, ISIS, the Islamic State of uh, Iraq and Syria, where Western powers have intervened militarily against predominantly Muslim peoples. And this uh, complex scenario has clearly raised uh, serious concerns regarding Muslim loyalties uh, in contemporary Britain. Historically speaking, however, it could be argued that uh, we have been at uh, a similar juncture before. If we quickly rewind to explore the encounter between Britain and the Muslim world as it was developing about a century ago, we can see some striking parallels. Then as now, an extensive range of people and social groups in Britain, including the media, the general public and politicians alike, manifested aspects of what to be now called <coughs> Islamophobia that is fear-mongering, negative stereotyping, abuse in their attitudes and behavior. It was reflected uh, in official policy documents, the voices of uh, state institutions and of those holding authoritative positions. Pan-Islam, that is a support for the notion of uh, a wider Muslim identity unfettered by national boundaries. And the defense of the Ottoman Caliphate, and then the Turkish Sultan, were viewed as un-British. The flip side to this scenario was the perception among groups of Muslims living in Britain that uh, European powers, including Britain itself, had declared <coughs> war on Islam more generally, and hence it was their duty to resist this new onslaught. For many of these uh, British Muslims, this defiance assumed the guise of various forms of political Islam or what we today call Islamism. In my lecture this uh, evening, I want to explore how Muslims juggled these kinds of dilemma, not in contemporary Britain, but rather in the context of developments taking place in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'll address how loyalty ebbed and flowed in practice. But in order to understand how British Muslims engage with the contemporary discourses on loyalty, we need to locate them within their social and political context. There is no doubt that the post, uh, that post the post-Crimean War of 1854-56 uh, and the so-called Indian Mutiny in 1857-58 um, in, in, in India, it, Sub subcontinent South Asia generally referred to as the as the Great Rebellion. Dislike of the Ottoman Turks uh, together with other Muslims and Islam per se accelerated. As conflicts intensified in the Ottomans' Balkan domains, anti-Muslim sentiment in Britain rose sharply. Islam along with the uh, Ottoman Caliphate were subjected to unrestrained popular and official ridicule and insults issued from pulpits and platforms no less than in the press. <coughs> Leading British politicians, especially Gladstone, a four-time prime minister, were increasingly vitriolic in their denunciation of Islam and the Ottoman Turks. The so-called Muslim mind, to which they frequently referred, was charged with being incapable of rational modern thought. Clergymen denounced uh, Islam as that, and I quote, most nauseous abomination, the source of all wickedness. The Ottoman Sultan Caliph was caricatured as the unspeakable Turk in the satirical magazine Punch. Such depictions were linked to and reflected more popular perceptions of Muslim despotism, corruption, religious fanaticism, sexual depravity and inequality 
as captured in literature, painting, and travel writing. They were further accentuated by reports of major policy decisions, diplomatic initiatives, and military expeditions undertaken around the world in pursuit of British imperial interests. And they were reproduced in such accessible and mass media forms as newspaper cartoons, music hall songs, novels, and religious journals, in photograph and in time cinema. This fast growing antagonism toward Islam and Muslims, perhaps not surprisingly, began to galvanize opinion among Muslims in Britain in defense of the Sultan Caliph as the key symbol of the Ummah, that is the concept of worldwide Muslim community, which Muslims cherished as a key expression of their religious identity. As British foreign policy moved away from its 19th century support for the Ottomans in their, in their guise as the sick man of, uh, of Europe, several strands of pan-Islam emerged and converged as a potentially powerful and effective strategy with which to challenge and defy this dominant and potentially destructive British discourse. Among these uh, British Muslims, I want to focus on two men who arguably intervened most vociferously and passionately in the debates of this period, namely Abdullah Quilliam, there on the left, um, particularly up to the point of his departure uh, uh, for Constantinople in 1908, and subsequently Marmaduke Pictor, again up there, who, though considerably younger than Quilliam, died around the same time, 1936, 1932, 1936. Let me look at, uh, at, uh, at, at Quilliam uh, first. Like many Victorians of this time, Quilliam, who was a solicitor with a substantial practice in Liverpool, had become increasingly doubtful of Orthodox Christian dogma, having first turned to Unitarianism and Deism, uh, which, like Islam, seemed to reject the belief in Trinity and encouraged the inquiry through reason. It proved to be a short step to Islam, which doctrinal similarities with Christianity notwithstanding, increasingly appeared to him to be a more reasonable, rational, and practical faith. In 1887, after a trip to Morocco, Quilliam converted to Islam, setting out his religious views in a pamphlet entitled The Faith of Islam. Quilliam was not a quiet man, uh, Muslim. He was proud of his new religious identity and he sought to <coughs> spread the, the the, the, the word. However, this propagation of his religious beliefs soon encountered intense hostility. Quilliam found himself insulted, ridiculed, and stigmatized, I quote him, as a species of monomaniac, with his critics calling him a, a, a lunatic, a fit case for uh, a straitjacket. His faith was described as, and I quote, uh, an, an exotic, un-English religion. Muhammad's creed was pronounced as Eastern humbug, which as history had proved had been hand in glove again, I quote, with cruelty, murder, moral and imperial decay, and barbarous ferocity. Quilliam was evicted from one premise, premises and, melted and pelted with mud, missiles, and filth along with the worshippers leaving the mosque uh, that he had set up in Liverpool. I've already described the context in which this vitriol against Kilquilliam and Islam was being generated. Almost uh, symbiotically, the anti-Muslim sentiment was fueled by British uh, foreign policy decisions, and so the stance taken by British governments in turn fed opposition to it uh, among some Muslims. Indeed, Quilliam's uh, strand of pan-Islam ran directly counter to the glorification of imperial supremacy, especially the civilizing mission that was so popular at the time, given that a substantial number of natives supposedly benefiting from it uh, uh, were Muslims. After all, 
It was his belief in Islam's moral superiority to Christianity that had resulted in his conversion in the first place. His commitment to pan-Islam had been further deepened by the conferment upon him of scholarly, religious and diplomatic titles and honors by Muslim rulers. Rather than fighting Muslims, in his view, Britain's imperial interests lay in developing peaceful relations with them. He saw Russia as the major strategic threat to Britain's wider imperial realm. And as Russian interests increasingly encroached on the Ottoman domains in Europe, he believed that an alliance with Turkey was eminently sensible from a British imperial perspective. Instead, what he saw were recurrent military campaigns being conducted against the Ottomans, <coughs> particularly the major wars in uh, Afghanistan, Sudan, and Egypt uh, towards the end of the, uh, of the 19th century. So Quillian, having concluded that, and I quote him, the Christian powers were preparing a new crusade, that's what he said, in order to shatter the Muslim powers under the pretext that they desired to civilize the world, unquote. Opposed, Muslim, uh, opposed Britain's uh, military actions in Egypt and Sudan and issued a series of defiant, potentially disloyal proclamations. On the Armenian question, for instance, uh, Quilliam defended the Ottomans in 1895 from criticism that he regarded as unbalanced and unfair. When Gladstone tried to uh, mobilize mass support for his demand that, that the government should take punitive measures against Turkey and eject it from Europe. This is what uh, Gladstone said, bag and baggage. Um, Quilliam preempted uh, Gladstone's speech in Liverpool by calling a meeting of his congregation of fellow Muslims to, to redress the balance. As he put it, Britain's policy of siding with the rebellions in the Balkans and Armenia was a Christian conspiracy against Islam aimed at breaking up the Ottoman Empire. The symbolic Ottoman Empire, the symbolic center of the Muslim world and its believers. He uh, talked of England virtually preaching a new crusade against Islam while hypocritically ignoring Christian uh, atrocities elsewhere. In 1897, he similarly accused the British Christian logic of double standards of extolling an American as a hero for killing innocent women and children in the crowded streets of Istanbul while denouncing, the, um, denouncing an Afghan fighting for his homeland. I quote him again as a traitor and a rebel, even though his land was being raided and his wives and children slain. Quite interesting to think, well, does that ring a bell? Quillian's warning that such a crusade might be answered with a jihad was dismissed by the British press as a hollow threat, and his criticisms were rejected as un-British or even treasonous. Quilliam was especially defined in his uh, defense of the, uh, of the successor to the, to the Mahdi against uh, British attempts to suppress the revolt in Sudan with Egyptian Muslim soldiers. Enraged by Kitchener's military campaign in the Sudan, he issued two so-called fatwas, or if you like, pronouncements. On the one hand, all too aware of domestic sensitivities, he sought to persuade Muslim imperial subjects against fighting, stating that uh, for, and I quote him again, for any true believers to take up arms against other Muslims is against the law of God and his holy prophet. <coughs> Soon after his, however, uh, after this, however, the, the Battle of Omdurman in 1898 uh, would severely test Quilliam's already stretched loyalties. This was a battle in which 11,000 Sudanese were mowed down by British artillery. Even the jingoistic Daily Mail was moved to call it, and I quote from the Daily Mail, an appalling slaughter. Quilliam denounced more accurately this particular as, and I quote him, murder and nothing else. He protested against the desecration of the Mahdi's tomb by Kitchener's troops. In his word, they had 
and I quote him, dragged the Mahdi's corpse from the grave and hacked off his head, throwing it in the, in the river, and requested a parliamentary inquiry into this scandalous outrage, arguing <laughs> that such desecration would only further stiffen local re resistance to British authority. While stopping short of calling for insurgency against Britain, he had no qualms in doing so when the French crushed anti-colonial, i.e. Muslim resistance in Algeria. So this is what, uh, what he was saying uh, um, you know, in relation, the relation to, uh, to Algeria. And he's clearly instigating Muslims to say, arise brethren and resist each and every one of these hypocritical, lying, thieving, murderous Christian nations. In 1904, Quigliam again practically exploded after the British victory in Somaliland. In a passionate but all the same ironic piece of writing, he chastised uh, Christians for their hypocrisy, arguing what had uh, become his usual uh, case uh, by now, that the military colonial, colonial thrusts into Muslim territory were, made, were, were masking a Christian war on Islam. So this is what uh, appears in one of his, uh, his journals and, and, and one of his uh, 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 magazines. Uh, sh uh, shout, hurrah, the yeah, Britons who thirst for blood and slaughter is so great. And the, the ends of the shout, a shout, hurrah, yeah, the devils and imps from hell to whom blood and rapine and, and slaughter is congenial sport. Given such bold statements, it was unsurprising that there were widespread allegations that his Muslim faith took precedence over his loyalty to the crown. At times, what appeared to be the very real conflict of loyalties between Britain, and quote from him, the country to which we owe loyal allegiance as British subjects, and the Ottoman Empire, to whom we also we are also bound with ties of uh, love and affection and the deepest feelings of religious sympathy. So between Britain uh, and the Ottoman Empire, these uh, provoked the demand that Quillian be tried for treason. But confident about his uh, twin loyalties, Quillian remained unabashed and stubbornly unapologetic, allowing his, uh, quote him, uh, religious zeal to outrun his patriotism. After all, and here I want to quote what he had to say at, length, at some length, because it gives us a good feel for the, uh, um, for the way that he saw where his loyalties lay, um, in the plural, lay. Uh, there is what, uh, what he uh, was saying about patriotism and his feelings about patriotism. And then sort of finishing off by talking about the man who places patriotism before religion cannot be a sincere Muslim. And uh, the paramount duty of all Muslims was to work for the unity of Muslims and Islam, even at the expense of the nation. Um, and then finally, the crime to place duties before those of patriotism. Uh, if that's the case, then I'm very guilty. Nay, more, I glory in such guilt. So he's actually doing it in a very sort of a, uh, what do you call it, a very uh, passionate way, um, privileging one over the other at this point in time. All this raises uh, the question whether the charges of uh, divided loyalties laid against Quillian were entirely fair or not. In 1899, for Quillian, it was perfectly possible to be a patriotic British Muslim, loyal to the Caliph uh, and, the, and, 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 and the Ummah. In his words, I quote him, a native-born Briton and, a, and as a loyal Muslim subject of Her Majesty, as one proud of my country and its honorable traditions. Interestingly, William revered the uh, British monarchy and by extension, though with some reservations, the existing British Empire. There is considerable historical hard evidence uh, for this. He offered, uh, for example, special prayers on the occasion of Queen Victoria's birthday 
and celebrated the Diamond Jubilee at the Liverpool Muslim Institute in 1897. He even sent the Queen a celebratory telegram in which he offered her, I quote him, the loyal felicitations of the British Muslims, and then published in his what is called a Muslim anthem, which is sung to the tune of the Royal Stage Queen. When Victoria died in 1901, he promptly sent another telegram conveying in his words that heartfelt condolences of the Muslim to Edward VII, whose portrait duly appeared on the cover of the next edition of another of his uh, publications, Islamic World. William, as the uh, loyal citizen uh, and patriot that he believed himself to be, also believed that uh, British imperial rule was benign and fair to the millions of further uh, crown Muslim subjects. When the Boer War broke out in 1899, he argued that, that there were far greater likelihood of Muslim freedom of worship in South Africa under British rule than under the dominion of what he described as the fanatical Dutch property. During the course of the Boer War, he proudly noted that several members uh, of the LMI, the Muslim Institute, were fighting in, in the Transvaal and that uh, a Muslim sister was a nurse with the ambulance corps. On the announcement of the British victory in 1902, William quickly issued a proclamation in which he celebrated uh, the honorable peace and glowingly praised the British nation for its military prowess. In, his, in this way, he showed that it was possible to be a Muslim who was highly critical of some aspects of British foreign policy, yet still someone who uh, remained, in, remained intensely patriotic to their country of birth. And this is uh, quite interesting in terms of what he has to say about uh, patriotism and, uh, and his engagement with the thank you in the eternal ruler. Hence, as citizens of the British Empire, he demanded from Indian Muslims loyalty to the Queen because, for him, Muslims under the British Crown, wherever they live, enjoyed benefits unparalleled elsewhere in the Muslim world. However, British support for various uh, uh, rebellions in the Balkans and uh, Greece against Turkey, and hence uh, uh, much closer to the center of, uh, Muslim, of his Muslim world, was much, much more problematic. We do not understand why various foreign and colonial office officials in the final decades of the 19th century could not recognize the significance and benefits of alliance with Muslim nations, especially the Ottomans, so as to maintain strategic dominance over Britain's old enemies, Russia and France. Speaking as a proclaimed, self proclaimed patriot, then William issued dire warning against driving Turkey away from Britain and foretold the consequence of this in terms of turning millions of loyal Muslims in the colonies before they came into a phalanx of the uh, bigger of the society. And that's uh, another quote from him, which at least uh, I think reinforces uh, uh, what, what I'm just concerned uh, about. With you. William's life uh, uh, then becomes a, a, a bit of a mystery. There are several years in the in the very early 20th century when he disappears off the historical radar, but in the in, but in late 1909 he reappeared and returned to Britain from uh, possibly Constantine, now calling himself a uh, uh, year. In contrast to his uh, previous stance, he no longer pursued his defence of Islam or Muslims, uh, Muslim leaders as passionately as he had done before. With the uh, Ottoman Sultan Abdul Hamid II deposed by the Young Turks and Britain officially fighting Turkey by the uh, end of uh, 1914. He was more anxious than he had uh, ever been in Liverpool to demonstrate his uh, loyalty to his crime and country and in fact uh, now repudiated 
his earlier rhetoric about religion taking precedence over patriotism, arguing that, and I quote him, our holy faith enjoins upon us to be loyal to whatever country under whose protection we reside. He wrote to Gray, the then foreign secretary, uh, pledging his uh, absolute loyalty to the British Crown, and moreover, offering his services to the government in promoting, and quoting him, loyalty amongst uh, the, the Muslims throughout the empire. So as to convey the genuineness of this loyalty, he also resigned as uh, vice president of the anglo Ottoman Association, itself under suspicion for undesirable activities in relation to terrorism. For the rest of the First World War, William kept a low profile, though increasingly, one of many rumors that surfaced after his death in 1932 suggested he may have carried out valuable secret service work for England during the century. Yet, when the war ended, his efforts to ensure that a defeated and humiliated Turkey received a fair hearing at the post-war peace conferences still occasionally threatened to undermine his country to a conspicuously, conspicuously loyal to, 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 to Britain. Let me now turn to Marmaduke Pickle, who in my view presents a more complex case. They it does reveal similar dilemmas to those encountered by Quigley. Son of an Anglican rector, Pickle initially hoped to become a soldier and join the Royal Engineer. Unsuccessful, he trained instead for the Levantine consular service, but failed again. He then spent two years in Palestine and Syria, acquiring a thorough knowledge of Arabic uh, as well as uh, the religions and customs of the region. So profound was the impact of these experiences that in 1895, he contemplated converting to, converting to Islam, but was discouraged by the Imam of the Central Mosque at Damascus who taught uh, the move to be chemical. Returning to England in 1896, he married and settled down as an orthodox, middle-class, church-going writer. But his personal fondness for Muslims and appreciation of Islam remained, and increasingly he deepened his intellectual and political engagement with Muslim teachers and society. An ardent monarchist, and by his own admission, quoting a patriotic English story, Pictorial was inconsistent in his approach to the empire. He could be critical of British imperialism in India, yet while traveling in Egypt in 1907, he became a strong supporter of Lord from Cromer's regime there. But then he was also deeply dismayed by what he regarded as Britain's reneging on its assurance given at Berlin back in 1878, guaranteeing the independence of the Ottoman Empire. Pictorial it was seen had come to admire what was happening in Ottoman land, especially after the young Turks had promised modernizing reforms on taking power in 1908. As he witnessed the Ottoman Empire crumbling, he became distressed by Britain's facility when Italy invaded his uh, uh, Tripolitanian uh, possessions in 1911. And likewise, its lack of support for Turkey's imperial sovereignty during the two Balkan Wars of 1912 and 13. Pictou found uh, that he could no longer remain a Muslim. In November 1912, soon after the eruption of the First uh, Balkan War, he started writing a series of articles in a publication called New Age, collectively entitled The Black Crusade.
impressed by the development he saw in Turkey during his four months sojourn. He uh, returned uh, home convinced that, uh, and again, it is fair for you to look at what he was saying, Turkey, a country in close touch with Europe, was the head of the progressive movement, uh, and they, they cut off that head as Russia are allowing them to right now. A hundred mad fanatics would rise instead of it. A monster would form to be defeated. Uh, uh, children. More determined than ever to uh, uh, to promote a cordial understanding between Great Britain and Turkey, on his return to London, he, along with William Arthurfield and Dusha Muhammad Ali, the editor of the outspoken African Times and an Orient Review helped set up an Ottoman committee. From the end of 1913, he became even more closely involved with the Anglo-Ottoman society, a body comprising a range of Muslim and Christian members, which, I quote uh, in, here, in British and continental political and churches, called for a European defense of Turkey. The Anglo-Ottoman society provided Tickpole with a great opportunity to write and speak critically on British attitudes and policies towards Turkey's progressive Muslims. But uh, from the amount of uh, public ridicule, public ridicule and private abuse he received, he knew that he was, again, quoting him, defending an unpopular cause. All the same, he asserted that in being critical, he was actually being a part patriotic. And this is uh, what uh, what he was saying, as an Englishman who was interested in Mohammedan as part and so until the balance is, is adjusted. Uh, I confess that I cannot see England in a mean and at the same time ruinous course of policy, that's why I'm criticizing, without emotion of a most decided thing. At the, uh, at the outbreak uh, of the, uh, the First World War approach, Pictou tried desperately hard to persuade the British government to secure the neutrality of the, of the Ottoman Empire. Along with uh, many fellow British Muslims, he was disappointed in British inability to prevent Turkey's alliance with Germany. Fellow convert uh, uh, John Parkinson expressed the unease regarding where his loyalty would lie if Turkey became an enemy. And this is John Carcasson was saying, as a British chair, uh, I would support my country to bring matters to a victorious ending. I would regret the necessity that compelled me to fight against Turkey. Yes, no. A few people with too much sympathize on many national ideas and within and down. But in the end, our greater duty to our own empire is uh, to our own native land, who is where uh, is, uh, uh, the loyalties are going to be where uh, going to lie. The Turkey's entry in the war on the side of Germany and uh, uh, its proclamation of, of, of jihad um, in 1914, which called on Muslims all over the world to That uh, pan is now, as he put it, and I quote him, the conscious effort for the united progress made by educated Muslims was the cornerstone of Israeli's constructive and policy. Indeed for him, for Patriarchy, indeed for him, Pan Islam was, and I quote him again, the most hopeful movement of our day, deserving the support of all enlightened people, and particularly the British government, since a British government inspired it in the first place. On uh, this basis, with a, with a small but influential network of British Muslims, Pixel initiated a pro Turkish public campaign, primarily drawing on support from the anglo ottoman society and another group, the Central Islamic Society. In letters to newspapers, in protest meetings, 
in public debates and lectures, and in resolutions to the coroner and the officers. He warned the British government of what he regarded as a malevolent corruption, influence, and ambition. Seeking to persuade ministers to agree a peace separately with the Ottoman Empire. As you know, and he we all have that the common intent in our mind to be, I quote him again, pitifully futile. This did not put a stop to what his critics dismissed as his ravings, however. After the Russian Revolution of February 1917, the Anglo Ottoman Society, with Pictol as its chairman, expressed deep gratitude for the repudiation of democratic Russia of all those designs of territorial expansion, which made the policy of autocratic Russia the peace of Europe in the past. Okay. When the British government set out the proposals to create a Jewish state in Palestine, Pictol once more intervened regarding this taking of territory from the Muslim government to be, and I quote him again, a world disaster. Again, this had little effect as the Belfort Declaration of November 1917 went on to promise British support for a national homeland for Jewish people in Palestine. Then, in late 1917, during the British-sponsored Arab Revolt, he wrote a letter to the uh, Saturday Review, which according to the Foreign Office uh, was likely to create bad feelings between Britain and its Arab allies, especially the Kingdom of Hijaz or the holy places of Islam, Mecca and, and Medina, by insinuating, and this is from intelligence sources, that uh, our ally King Hussein, and then ruler of the Hijaz and key British ally, is a venal traitor, sets the Arabs at variance, suggests that we have violated the holy territories, and goes on for pure turco fideism that is, love for the Turks. While Pictol quickly repudiated the accusations regarding Turks' hatred of the Arabs, one contemporary intelligence report viewed his writings as, and I quote, a masterpiece of enemy propaganda. Three months later, Pictol again courted controversy when in a challenging piece published in the radical anti-war newspaper workers dreadnought. He accused, and I quote him, our present rulers of attempting to pit the Arab-speaking Muslims against the Turkish-speaking Muslims on, according to him, our false ideal of nationality and patriotism. In his view, the great division in Islam is that between progressive and reactionary. And we, at present, according to him, are supporting the reactionaries i.e. the Grand Sheriff of Mecca, uh, King Hussein. Clearly then, Pictol represented a uh, main voice of dissent among British Muslims during this period. And while the impact of his words, like that of his fellow critics, proved relatively inconsequential, he was undoubtedly seen as a thorn in the sight of the British authorities, and on whom, along with the so-called and this is quite interesting, again, from the from, uh, intelligence papers, evoking mosque gang. Um, all of them, uh, they kept a careful uh, watch on. So according to the, the Foreign Office, uh, the, the evoking mosque gang yeah, uh, was, uh, was a body connected uh, um, this is the oldest mosque in, in Britain, going back to 18, uh, 1889. Uh, Haji Kamal the, the, the Imam, part of this Woking uh, mosque gang. So it's a body connected with various, in various ways, with, the, with a long established mosque and center of British Muslim worship at Woking that included, again, according to intelligence sources, such agitators as Pictol and Arthur Field and which uh, is in communication with the most dangerous conspirators in this country and abroad. Pictol was denounced as an enemy of Christendom, and the organizations to which he belonged were labeled anti-British. 
as intelligence reports explained, and I quote, the only reason for tolerating Kidwai, an Indian Muslim living in Britain, who in their view was the most dangerous, and Pictol, is that we have never had sufficient ground on which to put a stop to their activities, that they make a practice of sailing very close to the wind, unquote. But interestingly, while Kidwai, these reports explain, could, in quoting, be looked upon as an enemy to this country, unquote, Pictol, in contrast, and you might want to reflect on this, in contrast, again quoting, may be regarded, regarded as somewhat of a crank, but in all probability, at heart, he is a loyal British subject. This is what intelligence are, are telling us. Pictol was himself troubled by the aspersions that were cast on his loyalty. He was acutely aware that he was regarded as a traitor to his country by some people. And this certainly caused him no small personal distress. And this is how he tried to sort of kind of rationalize it. I care so much about the British Empire in the East. And he goes on and talks about it. And uh, in my small way, I've been, because of his patriotism, trying to make England realize uh, it, that, that uh, they are on the wrong path. Um, at the, uh, as time, uh, and again, he insisted, I'm pro-Turk, but not anti-British. After the uh, First World War was over, with the Ottoman Empire defeated, in theory at least, the tension between being competing, uh, being com competing loyalties uh, should, have, uh, should have ended. But it did not, thanks to the continuing uncertainty over the ultimate fate of the Ottoman Sultan, Caliph an outcome in which Britain had a key role to play. Victor joined other British Muslims to call on the government for a sympathetic hearing for in response to Turkey, pleading for the preservation of the Ottoman Caliphate and opposing a hereditary Arab alternative that was being mooted by Britain. The latter, they insisted, ran the risk of, I quote from him again, rousing very angry feelings in the Muslim world. And so it would not be in Britain's best interest. This controversy, according, accordingly, kept alive the question of loyalty long after the war with Turkey had ended, because Muslims who argued Turkey's case seemed to be continuing to support strongly and energetically the place that had so recently been Britain's explicit and defeated enemy. So what, uh, what conclusions can we, uh, can we draw from this admittedly brief potted history of two larger than life late 19th and early 20th uh, British, uh, uh, British Muslims who lived through tumultuous times, arguably as challenging as the ones uh, in which we today find ourselves First, it seems to me that when we look at indigenous, if you like, convert, British Muslims over a uh, hundred years ago, converts uh, uh, to Islam such as Quilliam and, and Pictou, but uh, also other well-known individuals include Lord Headley, there uh, uh, on, the, on the left, uh, or Bertram Khalid uh, Sheldrake, uh, one of the sergeants in the war, and Dame uh, Evelyn uh, Cobble uh, from Scotland. Even when they were wrestling with the conflicted feelings regarding their attachments to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to Britain, found that uh, their altruistic loyalty seemed to have a deeper emotional hold on them. Uh, indeed, some among them perceived there to be no conflict whatsoever between their religious affiliation and loyalty to their nation. For instance, Lord Headley in displayed little ambiguity in his repeated pronouncements of loyalty to the British Empire. He had no time for the Ottoman Caliph's call for a global jihad against the Entente powers, 
asserting that this was not a religious war. Rather, he unhesitatingly proposed a resolution from the, uh, uh, from the British Muslim Society, which at that time had in the region of uh, 400 to 600 members, uh, which stated, and we desire uh, to offer our wholehearted congratulations and so on and so forth, uh, because they were freely pouring out their lifeblood in defense of honor and for the love of, uh, of truth, uh, uh, truth and justice. And, uh, putting into effect the principles of Islam as inculcated, that's what he's saying, by the Holy Prophet Muhammad. So that's my first sort of kind of conclusion. Second, I would suggest that uh, these stories underline just how complex and layered loyalty is. It is also contextual. It means different things to different people, but it also means different things to the same people at different times. This was the case for many people, not just Muslims in Britain. Most obviously, members of the Irish and Jewish communities here, we can talk about uh, you know, their sort of, if you like, contractual loyalties during the First World War, perhaps in the discussion. It also applied to, uh, to Muslims, Sikhs and Hindus facing similar challenges and potentially divided loyalties in other parts of the British Empire. So it wasn't just Muslims uh, who were conflicted uh, at that time. Uh, and so we need to kind of reflect on, on the nature of, uh, of loyalties in that way. Put simply, what we can learn from looking at these uh, past stories, what history shows us, is that Muslims during this period, like all of us here today, I would suggest, were shaped by and themselves helped to shape multiple loyalties, which sometimes competed and conflicted with each other. These loyalties ebbed and flowed depending on their changing circumstances. British Muslim loyalty to Imperial Britain 100 years ago was neither always unequivocal nor for the most part emotionally driven. For most of them, and certainly for Quilliam and Pictou, when Britain was at war, the maxim, my country, right or wrong, served in the final analysis as their primary moral injunction. While Quilliam, to all intents and purposes, ceased being a critical friend, which is what he started off with, no longer asking challenging questions, and instead fell largely silent in his uh, public pronouncements. Pictou, despite a more openly critical stance, did not resist being cons conscripted, this is what actually happened to him, in the last months of the empire, and dubbed unambiguously as Britain's most loyal enemy. Thank you. Well, thank you to, to Professor uh, Ansari for a stimulating and uh, uh, thought-provoking lecture. Um, I think he's demonstrated uh, uh, very effectively that the more things change, uh, the more they stay the same. Um, but also, I think more seriously, um, I think there's, a, there's a, a call there for in the ebb and flow of um, loyalties a question over whether we can have critical loyalty and what that would constitute and how that would relate to you know, contemporary understandings of citizenship. Um, so I, I think we're, we're on an a, a excellent and productive ground for a rich uh, range of questions. Um, can I ask, uh, first of all, that we, uh, we turn over to, to, to Abdul Azim Ahmed, a PhD, a PhD student in the centre, uh, to invite questions from those of us who are remotely participating via the uh, MOOC. One of the questions we have is from Andrew Kahar. He's asking um, about Muslim migration into Britain um, and to what extent the British context was unique and different from other places like France and Germany and what your reflections were on that issue. Uh, Muslim migration to, to Britain. That's right, yeah. Uh, and its differences from other continental countries. Yes. Uh, I mean, if, we, if, we want, if one is thinking about uh, uh, migration to, to, to Britain, um, what, what we experience is that uh, it has been going on for a very, very long time. Um, 
we have communities here in, in Britain, <laughs> in, in a place like Cardiff, for example, that go back to uh, in something like the mid, mid 19th century. And we have communities uh, of uh, Yemeni and, uh, and Somali people in uh, Tau Shields and North Shields, and some of the other sort of like uh, centers uh, going back uh, a long way as well. Um, so there's several generations of, uh, of Muslims uh, who have been here. Um, and I don't think that one can actually call them in, you know, migrant Muslims in any sense whatsoever. So having, uh, having said that, um, if we kind of sort of compare uh, Britain's coming, uh, Muslims coming to Britain, we'd say Muslims going to France, then we'll find that there are actually very substantial similarities. And they uh, come out of uh, uh, the history of, the, of these two countries. After all, Britain was an empire. Um, and uh, for quite a bit of the time, certainly for people you know, like Headley, uh, Pictol, Quillian, and they said it in, in, in so many words, it was in fact a Muslim empire, the, which had more Muslims as part of it than, uh, um, than let's say, the Ottoman Empire. And, we talk, and they were talking about between 70 and 100 million Muslims who were part of this. So um, uh, one can see that uh, as uh, uh, coming from, from that particular uh, environment, uh, um, being part of the empire, being subjects of, of the crown, um, there would be a natural flow of people, Muslims uh, coming to Britain and uh, a substantial number of them actually settling here. Similar kind of thing could be said about, uh, about France. France was also an empire, and uh, certainly in terms of colonies, if one is looking at West Africa and, uh, and further afield, and there would be very substantial numbers of Muslims who, would be, who had been colonized. And so what you find is that uh, from 1830 onwards, when Algeria was, uh, was annexed, and then later on, 1882, Tunisia and Morocco and so on, what we find is that uh, from all those parts of the French Empire, there, were, there would be uh, a natural flow of, of Muslims uh, coming, to, uh, coming to France. Um, on the other side, I think German, Germany is a very different uh, kind of like situation because uh, um, Germany didn't have much of an empire apart from some sort of like regions in, in Africa. And therefore, uh, the process uh, there is a different one. Um, we, we have Turks coming as guest workers in the first instance, um, in, coming to, 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 to Germany. Um, whereas I suppose, uh, again, we can look at the, the Dutch, uh, there would be uh, Muslims coming, coming to, uh, to the Netherlands, again, because of the empire there in Indonesia and the, and the, the Far East. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process uh, and that uh, emerges out of the, uh, the historical sort of relations which exist, existed then and to a certain extent in, in a variety of ways continue to exist um, uh, between these empires, these European empires and uh, the so-called Muslim world. Excellent. Are there further questions? from? Okay, totally good. Well, should I open the, uh, the floor? Uh, to questions. Excellent. You tended to look at indigenous Muslims, and they tend to be pro ottoman What about those who are looking towards India, for instance? I know there were some even in the Woking Mosque that were pro Indian. In the, in the, in the Woking Mosque? Yes. Yeah. Were they, was there a division between this community? Um, I'm just curious about that. Well, uh, yes, uh, we, we were looking at uh, somebody like uh, Khwaja Kamaluddin. I uh, flicked him up there. Right. And, uh, and there is actually a very substantial amount of information uh, 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 about uh, his views and uh, those people who were associated with the, with the gang, so to speak. Um, and broadly, uh, what we find is that uh, uh, generally the, the view is not that different from that expressed by, uh, uh, well, Quillian perhaps less so because uh, he was he um, uh, he went so in communicado in the, in the first world war, but the big doll certainly. I mean, I don't know whether you're aware that he was actually he operated as an imam uh, at the at the Woking Mosque for for a period of time. Uh, he gave sermons uh, at the premises in London, 
primarily organized by the, the, the working mosque. Uh, so if you look at the, the, the publications and the major publications, it's, it's actually a, a very rich uh, a, a source uh, of information. And the, the, the Islamic Review, which uh, um, came out on a monthly basis from uh, 1913 through to about 1968. So it's a wonderful record. Um, and uh, the First World War was being discussed there. So what you find is that, that in fact, uh, as I suggest there, Lord Headley was uh, talking about the First World War in these terms with Maury Sadruddin. Maury Sadruddin was uh, the Imam of the mosque during the First World War. So there are those sorts of views that, uh, that were around. But uh, then, of course, uh, there were these very grave anxieties, you know, particularly after the uh, the, uh, uh, the the Sultan had uh, had declared that jihad immediately after, you know, his entry or their entry in the in the war in November 1914. You know, here is the the, the Caliph recognized as such by the worldwide Muslim community, making a call. How do we deal with that? And, uh, and so people like Lord Headley said, well, this is not a religious war. You know, uh, it's being fought for political uh, purposes uh, and for political ends. And we are not going to accept it as such. And therefore, we are not going to, uh, he operated in, uh, basically what you call a secular terrain. But then there were people like Mushir Hussein Kidvai, I mentioned him earlier, if you remember, who was saying, things very, very similar to Picto, you know, that, uh, yes, we have huge sympathy for, for, the, uh, for the Turks, and I would rather not fight against them, but that sympathy is different from loyalty. They say it in, fairly, in very, very clear terms. My loyalty is to the empire, because that's what I'm part of at the moment. So, you know, there were issues to do with that. Um, but what I would say is that uh, Muslims in Britain sort of operated within that frame. Having said that, I don't know whether you're aware, there were actually mutinies in the army. There were desertions that actually took, pl took place. And we are talking about uh, you know, uh, British, the British Indian Army, which was the largest voluntary force fighting on the, on the Western uh, uh, Front in the first place, and then in the Middle East, against the Ottomans in the, uh, you know, later on. What you find is that there are desertions from this, you know, uh, based on this kind of call from, uh, from the Ottoman Emperor. Um, there are uh, large numbers of uh, people, um, you know, South Asian Muslim, talking about uh, 1.7 million by the end of the, uh, uh, of the war, um, who were soldiers in the, uh, in the Indian army. A third of those were actually Muslims. So by and large, they were fighting against uh, the co-religionists in the Middle East. You know. And uh, given that that was the case, uh, they must have thought this through as well. What you find is that those desertions, and those mutinies were actually quite small. And so what you need to think about in terms of loyalty is uh, how do they remain loyal? in such, such large numbers. And that's why I was talking about what loyalties actually mean to different people at different times. And for them, by and large, it was contractual loyalty. It wasn't altruistic, you know, uh, coming from, if you like, uh, what you would say, high peasant background in the Punjab, basically in South Asia. What uh, did the, uh, the, the uh, fighting for the British actually mean? It meant, first of all, a, a stable salary, and there were famines taking place at that time. You know, so it was very important to have that uh, a stable salary, the wages. It meant uh, pensions. It meant uh, rewards later on in terms of allotments and land grants and so on and so forth. So. Those sorts of, if you like, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, rewards uh, were, were being promised. And then uh, also um, there were traditions within, you know, uh, 
to do with uh, uh, you know, this idea, which is stereotypical and has been described, you know, warrior people. Uh, it's part of their tradition to be involved in fighting. Um, there were issues to do with honor uh, of, the, of the community, you know, uh, which, should be, which, which were, was implicated in, in their, their loyalty. So it was loyalty to those sorts of things. Um, it was loyalty to the regiment in which they'd been part of for a very, very long time. And it, for some, but not the large majority of, uh, of these people, it wasn't loyalty to the empire. There was no conscious, real consciousness of that as far as these uh, uh, village people were concerned. You know, there were local loyalties, there were issues of tradition, uh, families and so on were uh, at the, at the forefront of their thoughts, not uh, you know my king, uh, my my uh, you know uh, uh, my uh, yeah king and country. Um, they weren't fighting for that, broadly speaking. Thank you for that. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time uh, now for questions, but we can continue these discussions after the lecture, and I, I uh, uh, commend you to do so. Um, but I think we are well on the way towards uh, a typology of loyalty, uh, really, and what a valuable thing uh, that would be. Um, so uh, I would like to say a few words at the end. Um, firstly, I'd like to flag up um, next week's uh, lecture, which is um, going to be given by uh, Dr. Sario Contractor, uh, and will be entitled um, uh, Demystifying uh, the Muslim are Faithful Feminists. Um, uh, that will, of course, be at the same time, the same place next week. So uh, please do uh, come along. Um, I would like to thank you all for coming. It's magnificent to see such turnouts here and, of course, the, the digital turnout via the, uh, uh, the MOOC um, and the Google Hangout. Uh, and uh, I just uh, uh, I wish you a, a safe journey home. Thanks very much. Thank you. That's great.